As Sally mentioned, we are on an eight-week journey that will carry us to the end of August. And at each stop along the way, we will read a different scripture in the Bible, a story that involves a return, a return of a person or a group of people back to where they needed to go. And so it is very appropriate that today's scripture story is, in fact, the first great return story in the entire Bible. I wonder if you can determine who it is that I'm describing here. It's a group of people that have been wandering around lost for a very, very long time. The corn and the other vegetables that they brought with them have long since been consumed. The jars of oil and the canisters of spices were eaten a long, long time ago. All that's left now is the reddened, sun-scorched skin on their back from years and years of wandering under the hot sun and walking along dusty trails. It's making them think about that warm bed that they would love to have or that soft, warm blanket, but all they can think about is how much their legs are sore and their ankles seem swollen and, and their throats seem part. It's been 40 years since they first left, but frankly, even, even slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt seemed a lot better than what they have now. They're not even thinking about the bruises that are on their back because they've been so reddened by the sun. And all of this talk, frankly, about a promised land, really? When Moses first said that they would be going to a land flowing with milk and honey, even the text today promised a land in which wells and water would be gushing up through the valleys and the hills, a land replete with fresh produce, a land of paradise. I mean, come on, really? After 40 plus years of wandering in the wilderness, even the future seemed like a distant memory. So who am I describing there? Students of the Bible, even novice attendees of church would probably automatically assume that I was describing the Israelites in the book of Exodus, but I'm not, at least not exclusively. I'm describing you. I'm describing many, if not most, of you. You know, there are times when preaching can be a challenge for preachers like me. When you take a look at a Scripture passage and you wonder, what on earth does this have to do with the lives of people today? Preachers read a Scripture passage and they are searching for an opening in which a congregation can be invited to relate to the needs of the people in the story. When you're searching for the felt need in the passage that might connect to the real life needs of real people in real time. It can be hard to do that sometimes, but not today. There is no such challenge today because what we have before us is the image of a wilderness, a vast, lonely, desolate place of suffering and heartache and misery a setting which seems interminable, a misery that seems to drag on forever and ever. And it wouldn't take long for many of us, if not most of us, frankly, if not all of us, to find at least one part in our lives this morning that can't identify in some way with the wilderness setting in the Bible. For any of us who are wandering through the wilderness of life, maybe even wandering through it right now in this very moment, sitting here in the sanctuary, this text is for you. If last Sunday's sermon, if last Sunday's story about return was filled with joy and celebration and new hope, then today's text is very different, isn't it? It's more reflective, but I would say to you it is no less critical and no less relevant to our needs today. Because I have a hunch, 
that there are some of us in this place today who are wandering in a wilderness as well. And if you are, here's the first bit of news for you. You're not alone. Because the wilderness, in fact, is an image that occurs over and over in the Bible. It is one of the most common set pieces on the entire biblical stage. You look around and you'll find some familiar people in it. David was there. Before he became King David, he was wandering in the wilderness, fleeing for his life, trying to escape the wrath of a very angry King Saul. Elijah was there too. He was in the wilderness, fleeing because he had a death sentence over his head. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel wanted him dead. And there was Elijah in the wilderness. He even asked God to take his life right then and there because he couldn't take it anymore. John the Baptist was in the wilderness too. In fact, he set up shop there. He based his operations there. He had his office in the wilderness. And from there, he began to preach a message of repentance, a controversial message of the kingdom of God. And people got rubbed the wrong way, and eventually, it cost John the Baptist his life. And you know what? Even Jesus was there. Jesus was in the wilderness too, when you think about it. Before he uttered any prophetic teachings, before he did any kind of miracles, Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights identifying with the fullness of what it meant to be human, all of the suffering, fatigue, tiredness, hunger, loneliness, despair, all that makes humans human, Jesus experienced it in the depth of the wilderness. He was there too. And so even even if the greatest heroes in the Bible experience the wilderness in their lives, then it shouldn't surprise you that you do too. Now, I can't possibly describe the peculiarities of your own wilderness this morning, but you know what they are. Maybe your wilderness is of a physical nature. Maybe it is a health that is in decline. Maybe you recently got a doctor's diagnosis. Maybe as you confront your own mortality, you realize that you have more years behind you than you do ahead of you, and it feels like a wilderness. Maybe your wilderness is not physical at all. Maybe it's emotional or mental. Maybe you've been long plagued by the shadows in your own spirit as shame and guilt has haunted you for things in your past that you simply cannot acknowledge. Maybe your wilderness is littered by the scorched relationships of people in your life, people that you once trusted, people that you're still trying to love, people who have hurt you, or people that you have hurt. And rather than a wellspring of mercy and forgiveness creating an oasis to irrigate your scorched souls, maybe in your relationships with that particular person, it feels like wilderness wandering. Maybe your wilderness has nothing to do with the past or the present at all. Maybe your wilderness is all tied into an anxiety about your future, about a financial condition that doesn't seem to improve, about a job search that seems to go nowhere. Or maybe your wilderness is the toughest of all, an internal one. Maybe you find yourself today struggling to find out who you really are, struggling to find out what you are supposed to become. And what makes things difficult is that as you come to terms with your own identity, you're discovering people who are not accepting you for who you really are. The sum cumulative effect of all of this wandering is that in the midst of all of this wilderness, you are really struggling with this fundamental question, where is God? Your toughest wilderness is a theological one. And if you are resonating with any of this for any reason, 
then here's the first bit of news. Look around you. You're not alone. There are other people in that wilderness. You are surrounded by Israelites. And Deuteronomy 8, that same good news for the Exodus Israelites is that same good news for you. You want to know something else that's interesting about the wilderness? In biblical times, just like life itself, the wilderness was rarely ever completely flat. We hear about this over and over again, that when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, oftentimes they were climbing uphill, <coughs> or they were descending downhill. Rarely was it ever even and easy and flat, and that's a lot like life, because you can identify in your own life, even right now, some of those amazing uphill journeys, as well as some of those downhill journeys. You can think of them. I know you can. I've had them. You have too. You know, those uphill moments where life was just a slog, and every step that you took through that situation that you're thinking of seemed harder than the one before. And the cumulative effect of all of these steps going up this tough incline is that you got tired, you got desperate, you got weary. Life is filled with uphill climbs. The wilderness is filled with. But even in the midst of the wilderness, by the way, there are those glorious downhill slopes as well. You know what I'm talking about. Those joyful, giddy moments when you pass the crest of a hill and you begin to start the downward slope and all of a sudden gravity is not your foe anymore but your friend and life becomes giddy and free and easy and you begin to coast and you wish, you wish that you could ride this downhill slope forever. Wouldn't that be nice if life was all downhill? But it's not. But here's what's interesting. When you really think about it, yes, we can identify the uphill days in our lives. Yes, we can certainly identify the downhill days. But most of the time, most of our days, it's hard to figure out whether it's an uphill day or a downhill day. These distinctions that we like to make between uphill and downhill, they're they're not very useful on most days of our lives when uphill and downhill become completely indistinguishable. We discover that these labels are often very ambiguous and vague. And when you really think about it, isn't that what life really is like? Most of the time, most of our days, when we look back at the day that we've just lived, we think to ourselves, was it a good day or a bad day? I can't tell. It had some good moments. It had some bad moments. But I can't, I can't find the meaning of it. Life is filled with ambiguities. And it's that ambiguity that causes us often to lie in bed and stare at the ceiling in the darkness of our bedroom wondering what it all means. And you lie awake thinking to yourself, there must be something more to this moment. There must be something deeper in my life. But I can't find it. And it is in that ambiguity that the toughest wilderness exists. Maybe, maybe it's not whether or not we are walking uphill or downhill at all but how we perceive every moment. Maybe, maybe, instead of every moment being ambiguous, there is a clarity for us, the presence of something that we've missed all along. To unpack that meaning, I'd, I'd like for you to take a bit of an imaginary journey with me. Let's pretend for a moment that we're on a walk together or on a, a run together, and the path that we are running has uphills and downhills. In other words, we're not in Florida. 
all right? Maybe we're somewhere in Iowa. And as we're walking together, notice that the path doesn't stay flat for very long. Eventually, we start ascending. There's an elevation. There's a bit of a hill going up. And the hill is such that you can't see where the top of the hill is. All you know is that we're climbing together. And it doesn't take very long before we realize that each step is getting a little more difficult than the step before. Gravity is our foe. Our legs begin to ache. Our ankles become stiff. We kind of wonder whether or not this uphill climb is ever going to end. And we start to get miserable. And we start to get hungry. And we start to get tired. That's a lot of what life is like, right? But I'd like for you to notice something on this imaginary walk. There's something about walking uphill that forces you to go slower than you normally would. It could be muscle fatigue, it could be weariness, but whenever you go uphill, you have to go slower. And what happens when you go slower in life through hardship? All of a sudden, it forces you to observe your surroundings in a way that you've never observed them before. You begin to take notice of your environment. You see little blessings along the way, along the roads, and in your companions that you would have missed entirely if you were speeding at your own preferred pace. But sometimes that's what uphill climbs do. They force you to slow down. They force you to see with new eyes. They force you to acknowledge the blessings of the moment that you wouldn't have seen. What's the other thing that uphill climbs do? Well, they make your muscles ache. They make your muscles burn. But you know what? That's how muscles grow, isn't it? That's how we get stronger. Our muscles get a workout, and what that does is it simply prepares us for the next inevitable uphill that's to come. You know what we discover on this imaginary walk? Maybe, maybe there's a benefit to the uphill climbs after all. Yes, the uphill moments are hard, but they can be good because they force you to notice things that you've never noticed before. That, that's what Deuteronomy 8 told the Israelites. You were hungry, but you didn't even know it, but God was feeding you. You were tired, but you didn't even know it, that God was strengthening you. And sometimes it's only through the slog of life that we can discover the God who has been with us all along. So on this imaginary walk, let's imagine that we get to the very top of the hill, and all of a sudden we get past the crest, and we're starting the downhill turn. And we think to ourselves, ah, finally, we can just coast. Gravity is now our friend. We can take it easy. We can let the downhill slope go ahead and take our rhythms, and we can walk freely and joyfully, and like Leonardo DiCaprio at the front of Titanic, we can feel like king of the world. Maybe the only time I ever compare myself to Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> but you've been there. You know what that's like. You walk the downhill, and things easier and so much free, and the thing that you want to do is go as fast as you can and catch up on lost time and to speed up with a pace that feels breathtaking and gleeful. But you know what? Inherent to every downhill slope is risk. Because even just the slightest even just the momentary lapse of focus and concentration would mean that your footing would slip. You would veer off the trail. You would tumble and stumble and get hurt. So what it means is that even when life is easy, there is a caution 
for you to not get too prideful, not get too arrogant, to take a regular inventory of the darkness within your life and seek repentance and forgiveness, lest you fall for the lie that all the good things in your life come from your own merits. You know what you discover? All of a sudden, even the downhills of life, while they are good, they can also be risky. And what we discover in the wilderness of life is that the highs are never quite as high as we think they are, but that also means that even the lows of life are never, ever as rock bottom as we first believe. Because no matter what happens, God is in it. No matter how high your life gets, no matter how low you feel, God is in your life at work, whether you recognize it or not. You know, the Greeks had a very special word for time. We like to think of time chronologically as a linear progression of past followed by present, followed by future. We follow time with our watches and our calendars as a, as a progression, a mechanical cold progression that marches forward whether we want to or not. But the Greeks had a special word for time, a word called kairos, that reminded them that in every single moment there was special potential, that every second, every moment was not simply one part of a linear progression of a mechanical clock. Every moment had the possibility of being rich with meaning and possibility. And this is what the Israelites discovered in their wilderness journey, that even though they were lost and desperate and confused, every moment, every step, march forward, God was in it. And that's the reminder for us, isn't it? As we march forward in this return series, we will discover lots of different ways that God is calling us to return to return to our spiritual practices, to return with gratitude, to return our talents and our joys for the kingdom's service, to return to the hope of the promised land. But we can't take one more step forward in this return journey until we return to this, returning to a trust in God, returning to a belief that God is always with us, no matter how vague or ambiguous or high or low your life gets, there is is one incontrovertible, irrepressible truth. No matter what happens, God is in your life. And in the very end, that's good news, isn't it? Let's pray together. (coughs) God, only you can peer deep into the darkness of our souls today to know what it is that we are really struggling with. All we can assume is that we are all in this together and that whatever wilderness we are facing, it is shared in kinship with this community of faith. And so, God, we thank you for the gift of this moment and the way that you are calling us now to return to a trust and confidence in you. For anyone who is struggling, make your love real to them. Encourage them to seek out guidance and help. Perhaps they will write their need on a connection card or seek out the help of a fellow companion here at this church or one of the clergy. Remind them that they are not alone, that even the greats of the Bible have walked in the wilderness. And it can be, it can be a place of new hope and new life, because no matter what happens, you are in it. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen.